So I'm going to start, kick us off this morning with um, homage to the ancestors. I'm going to start with the, in a sense, the founding father of Feng Shui, the Emperor Dai Yu, who um, was the founder of the Xia dynasty, born in 2205 BC, and this is him depicted in a Han dynasty bas, bas relief. Um, he is holding something in his hand that might be a divining rod of some sort, might be a gnomon for calculating astronomy, astron astronomical alignment. Um, the inscription around the edge of this bas relief says, you, founder of the Xia dynasty, was a master in the science of the earth. That's Shangdi, which is the um, surveying earth, or geography as it's usually translated. And in those matters concerning water veins and springs. He was well acquainted with the yin principle, and when required, built dams. He was famous for um, introducing irrigation, dams, irrigation, working with water in that way. He was also famous for divining sites for wells to found cities and towns on. Um, he was well acquainted with the yin principle. What could this mean? Was he cold and wet? <laughs> Did he have lots of concubines? <laughs> um, was he conversant with the spirits? Did he function shamanistically as an intercessor between heaven and earth? Um, which is the natural role of an emperor to intercede between heaven and earth and make sure things are aligned properly for the health and prosperity of his people. Um, so I, we introduce Dayu partly because he's the founding father of Feng Shui and it's appropriate to honor the ancestors at the beginning, um, but also because it's clear that he was a diviner and a shaman. Um, there has been some debate in Feng Shui as to whether we need to keep out the magic and just make it an intellectual process. Um, there are those of us who believe this is a preposterous notion. <laughs> um, and even more that if we're practicing professionally today, we need to be embracing a kind of global, eclectic, geomantic understanding that brings the best from all traditions. Um, certainly it helps to know a bit of Vastu if you're working with Hindu clients, for example. <laughs> One of the interesting things that Da Yu, who's also known as Kuang Yu, famously issued an edict that is technically still in force today in China. No dwelling shall be built until the earth diviners have confirmed the intended building site to be free of earth demons. Um, they've started doing this in Austria again now in contemporary building practice. <laughs> getting a dowser out to check for dodgy earth energies before starting a new housing development. So things are starting to come full circle in terms of our understanding and sensitivity to the mysteries of the earth. Um, let's move forward in time, about 3,000 years, to Chen Su Sao. This is the next writing I've discovered in the, amongst the Chinese Feng Shui classics on the subject of the earth, earth energies. Chen Su Xiao wrote this. In the subterranean regions, there are alternate layers of earth and rock and flowing spring waters. These strata rest upon thousands of vapors, that's qi, vapors, which are distributed in tens of thousands of branches, veins, and thread-like openings. So he's building a model of the earth as having a meridian system, just as we as our individuals have the meridian system of the acupuncture tradition. Uh, the body of the earth is like that of a human being. Ordinary people, not being able to see the veins and vessels which are disposed in order within the body of man, think that it is no more than a lump of solid flesh. Likewise, not being able to see the veins and vessels which are disposed in order under the ground, they think that the earth is just an homogeneous mass. Water flows in subterranean courses called veins of the dragon, lung mai, dragon meridians, dragon veins. Uh, passing to and fro out of sight, the hidden veins of water serve, like the bloodstream of animals, to remove impurities from the body of the earth and to deposit curative minerals within it. Um, the acupuncturists among you might recognize that in this last line, we've got a very clear reference to a fundamental distinction made in acupuncture of types of chi. Um, 
the chi that flows in our meridians can be divided simply into the outer defensive protective chi called wei chi and the more internal nourishing um, yin chi, the ying chi. So we have a clear crossover from the human acupuncture tradition, this reference to the wei chi and the ying chi, the protective defensive yang outer aspect of our chi and the internal nourishing. Um, and when we're doing acupuncture for people or when we're doing acupuncture for the earth, we are working with a combination of clearing impurities that have been held in the external layers and then ensuring the free, healthy flow of the nourishing energy within. And the two work one with the other, of course, as yin yang does. The Earth's circulatory system is matched by an ever undulating network of currents in the atmosphere. The currents running through the Mai, the meridians, carry the chi, the breaths of life. So here we have a reference not just to the earth energies, but to the atmosphere, to the weather. Um, and there's a very clear link between the earth energies and weather magic, for example. Um, any traditional site of weather magic, however, doused is very plainly um, got not just um, an elemental portal through to uh, a place that you can converse with the elemental spirits of weather, um, but also is on the appropriate earth energy for doing it. So rain dances or whatever are very much tied up with doing it at the right spot as well as doing the ceremony. Let's move forward a little bit further to the Shui Peng Ba Jen Fa, which is really the classic feng shui text on divining underground energies. It's the proto-text on geopathic stress. Um, so let's just talk about the wet compass needle for a moment. Before the dry compass needle that we have in the center of our lopans nowadays was invented, um, the old tradition was to, um, yeah, you get a thin fish-shaped piece of metal, tusun, which is two short inches long by five fen, which is half an inch wide. It's heated to magnetize it. It's then placed delicately on the bowl of water, on the surface of water, and the surface tension should hold it floating. Um, this is actually done three times. Floating on the water, the movements of the needle determine whether the metal, whether there's metal in the ground. This is the earliest reference to this earth energy divining. We then, a little later in the Ming Dynasty, we get this fabulous tech, the Shui Peng Ba Jin Fa describes the technique in more detail. The Feng Shui master places a bowl of pure spring water that hasn't touched metal. In the center of the room, doorway, or tomb site, in other words, the spots you'd place your lopan nowadays. The fish needle is then placed in the bowl to float on the surface of the water. It happens three times. The needle will orient north-south, naturally, with the head of the fish pointing south, traditionally. And the way in which the fish needle moves can be interpreted to reveal eight different situations. So this is a, a discrete divinatory system. And just to scamper through it, <coughs> we're looking at the trembling movements, we're looking at the, um, the trembling and the direction that the fish needle moves. So if you, if you can read this, <coughs> Excuse me. We're looking for ant holes, underground tombs. <coughs> Sorry. Um, old underground wells and old coffins. So this is all kind of obvious. We don't want to build our houses over the sites of old coffins. We might get subsidence, we might get ghosts. Um, the ant's nest is interesting. There's an African geomantic tradition that when you're going to build a house, you move an ant's nest to the area. And if the ants stay there, you don't build there because ants are known to like geopathic stress as much as mammals don't like it. Um, what else do we have? Underground wells we know we don't want inside the house. It represents a very dark, deep, cold energy coming up into a, a Yang Jaya house of the living. Um, the second category, Zun, steady is auspicious. 
If the needle doesn't jump about, then the earth energies are probably neutral or sweet. <coughs> if there's um, um, oh, and in this text, if it, there's no cavity or metal underground, cavity represents underground stream, as well as hollow cavity. Um, if it wiggles slightly to the east, there may be buried animal bones. You don't really want to build your house over the site of an old abattoir, either. Um, or to the west, jades and jewellery. This is the most auspicious indication of all, as the owner will have prosperity. So if there's jades and jewellery underground, what magical sympathetic resonance is it that means the present owner will have prosperity too? Is it some subtle, some subtle resonance? Uh, the Chinese explanation is, of course, that the owner can dig them up and sell them. <laughs> um, what else have we got? Too high salt content, buried pork beef bones. To the west, the ground is very strong chi. That means geological fault. There's a famous story of when they were building the wall around the imperial city in Beijing. The very northwest corner kept falling down. And they rebuilt it several times, and it promptly fell down again. And eventually they took omens and decided that um, humans were not supposed to be perfect. Only the divine was for perfection. So they left it on, on a very slight angle, and they chamfered the corner, the northwest corner. Um, modern seismological analysis has discovered a geological fault running right across that corner, which is why it kept falling down. So geological faults are a very obvious example of a place you don't want to build your house over. Um, partly the instability and partly the radon gas that can rise, radioactive radon gas that can rise up through the geological faults. Um, to the west, the ground is very strong. To the north, there may be old weapons buried, old battlegrounds, traditionally riddled with ghosts. Worked quite a few Civil War battlegrounds around Britain over the years. Iron underground, or hollows underground, the underground stream. This is the straightforward, so number four, the up and down, is analogous to the old um, forked hazel twig of water dividing, which will just move up or down to indicate what it is you're looking for. Fifth category, the needle is afraid. It tries to hide. Again, underground streams, underground lakes, or the, uh, an empty underground lake. Rocks, um, presumably geological fault and shiny rocks, crystals, quartzes, which are again traditionally useful places to go for vision quests, but quite difficult energetically to live in permanently for secular living. Just as sites of radioactivity, a traditional vision quest ground, certainly in Canada and Australia, but aren't so good for living in permanently. Metal underground, underground streams, much metal. There's um, an area of northwest China that has very high iron content in its sandstone mountains to the point where people know not to live there. It's too injurious to health to live there, so it's kind of a desert as far as humans are concerned. Huge rocks nearby, big geological faulting. The Di Qi, the Earth Qi, the breaths of life of the Earth might be erupting vertically. San Andreas fault comes to mind. And just as a little aside, is there any link between the enormous amounts of radon gas let up by the San Andreas Fault and the resulting radioactivity and the ability of Hollywood to have completely englamoured the world? Well, Hollywood and Mecca between them have englamoured the world <laughs> um, in our current state of being. And the text finishes, Chi comes from the earth and moves upwards. If it's too strong, it's not good to build. If there's none at all, maybe there's too much metal or hard rock. Nothing will grow, this is also bad. So always switching between the common sense, the practical, and the metaphysical. You all conversant with the expression sha, sha chi. It means toxic chi or hostile environmental influences. Nowadays it can be applied to any hostile feature in the environment, from um, an ugly deformed tree outside your front door, to a neighbor's ornamental cannon pointing at your front door, through to subtle astrological, psychological threats, um, and the whole of compass school teachings, the astrological threats that can impact on your own chart or your house according to the year. But the roots of the ideogram, if we have a look at it, 
Oh, the top, the top ideogram is the ideogram for Sha. And this is derived from sub-characters. The middle character is Sha to decapitate or slay or kill. And the bottom represents quite simply ascending flames rising from beneath the ground. This represents the horizontal line as the Earth's surface and these four rays of fire, four licks of flame rising from beneath. Now, does that sound like hostile energy rising from beneath the ground surface as the root meaning of Sha? Um, and we can corroborate that to an extent nowadays with looking at the way radon gas has an impact on um, hitting our RNA and provoking tra cancerous transformations, for example. So, Sha, root meaning, a killing fire force coming from beneath the ground. All the other derivations are subsequent to that. Um, so, and we're probably all tempted sometimes to turn a blind eye to how nasty the earth energies are in a place and just do the intellectual low pan rearranging the furniture. No point rearranging the furniture whatsoever if you haven't addressed what's going on beneath the building. Um, and the key spots are the key spots that we know of in feng shui anyway. Under the bed is obvious because we spend, if we're lucky, a third of our lives in bed. Under the center of the house, under the tai chi, it's particularly important the clarity of the earth energies under the tai chi of the house for the spiritual and um, every dimension of health of the family. Uh, and also the front door. If there's earth energies are dodgy under the front door, if there's a line running in through the front door or across the front door, then we'll have bad luck, bad quality workmanship, um, difficulty selling our house, nasty atmosphere in the house, because the front door is, of course, the portal for the heaven chi to come in. Uh, and if that gets queered by the dodgy earth energies, then bad luck is what happens. So here's um, a few relatively obvious bits of environmental potential environmental problems to think about, all broadly under the heading geopathic stress. Um, we've got volcanoes, we've got faults, we've got radon gas, we've got basalt sills, we've got a city tucked in there. <laughs> we've got earthquakes and thrust rings, and then we've got mineral seams, and then we've got what we can do to insult the earth further um, by building a city, um, by mines and cuttings, railway cuttings. And we've got the underground streams, we've got the ability of the well to transmit deep earth energies that we don't want in our home up into the house. And we've also got electricity and lightning and the whole relationship with climate and weather. Um, it is said that lightning will only strike on geopathic stress crossing points, quite specifically the crossing of a pair of underground streams that are registering geopathic stress, the carrying shachi. Um, anything else here? Tombs, the sun, ultraviolet, and infrared, and radio waves, and gamma rays. Um, I'm quite glad to see we don't have a mobile phone mast up on that diagram. <laughs> They're particularly nasty. I don't know what to do with them. Up. Is that 10? Thanks. I don't know what to do with um, them except to say that humans are getting adaptable. I see less damage as a cranial osteopath in people's heads now from mobile phones than I was 15 years ago. And partly that's improvement in technology and partly I think that's some um, adapt human adaptability. I was tempted to um, start an internet rumor a few years ago of a huge rise in incidents of spontaneous combustion related to the introduction of the 5G network. <laughs> I'll look around a bit. <laughs> okay, so having had our little proto, proto view from five, 600 years ago of the classical Chinese take on geopathic stress, this is the state of thinking today. When broadly speaking, we can divide the types of geopathic stress into yin fields and yang fields. Yin fields being um, erring on the side of degeneration and stagnation. Yang fields erring on the side of fast-growing tumors and inflammations and manic behavior. 
and crossovers between the two. So generally speaking, um, British dowsers consider that the underground water veins that are registering distress in their information field are considered the most harmful to health. In traditional European dowsing, these have been known as black streams if they're running dirty, or white streams if they're running clean and healthy. Um, obviously, the language is um, difficult in this day and age. Um, so I tend to use the Chinese idiom, the Sha stream is a toxic stream, or a Sheng stream is a healthy, fertile stream. But underground streams feature major. Um, and it's a simple matter. I had a little look through this church this morning when I arrived to see what we had in the way of the balance of Sha and Sheng Chi with the underground streams running under this place. And I think good work's been done here. I think um, some people who know what they're doing have done some space clearing here as part of probably when this church was rebuilt after the IRA bomb in, when was that, 83, 93? So we've got underground water veins, we've got geological faults, we've got radon gas, which is um, an aspect of the Earth's natural background radioactivity, but it rises to the Earth's surface when it becomes as... Um, Originally, it's considered that radiation on this planet came to us from exploding super, supernovae elsewhere in the galaxies and um, has been lodged into, first as uranium-238, lodged into our bedrock. Um, and radio, radioactive rock has this radioactive breakdown where it sends off, fires off a proton and a neutron, is it? Or a proton and an electron, I can't quite remember and breaks down to a series of daughter isotopes. When it gets to radon, which is 222 from uranium-238, that's when it becomes gaseous and can rise up to the Earth's surface. So um, if we're trying to translate Shachi, or geopathic stress, into modern science, a very good place to start is to look at our radon gas concentrations. Mineral deposits can provoke all sorts of problems. Um, generally, they would create a little yang spiral um, that can provoke inflammations and tumors. But they're also prone, with, prone to being mined, which will then cause all sorts of um, other problems. Um, destabilize the earth. I'm not even going to mention fracking, <laughs> because there are so many gross problems to think about with fracking that we don't need to consider the subtle geopathic stress problems as well involved. Ley lines, and ley line crossings coming down the list. This is really this list in order of importance that geomancers generally consider the earth energies to be. We have a sweet ley line running down the length of this church, as would be appropriate. Um, and the ley line always has three components, a central spirit midline and a pair of masculine and feminine currents that will weave around it like caduceus. And there's actually a crossing point. The, um, in this church, the female current comes down this side, male current comes down this side, and they cross just where you're sitting. <laughs> <laughs> you're on the hot spot in this church, or the, one of the sweet spots in this church. Uh, the other sweet spot is up at the altar, where we have what's called a blind spring. Um, <coughs> which is technically... Imagine a, a deep underground stream running under hydrostatic pressure, flowing water. And if there's a fissure in the earth, the hydrostatic pressure forces the earth, the water upwards till it reaches another impermeable layer, at which point it radiates out in a series of little streams. And what you're left with is called in British dowsing a blind spring or in American dowsing a water dome. And it is a sweet, um, goddess-flavored, watery earth energy that um, is traditionally found at every altar of every decent church in Europe. Um, so really part of the prerequisites of designing sacred space is if you've got a ley line crossing over a, a blind spring, then that's a sweet enough spot to bother to put the shed up, bother to put a roof up, um, call it a church, call it a sacred space of some sort. Geomagnetic grid crossings are further down the list, curry grids and Hartman grids and so on. Generally, my experience of working with earth acupuncture is that 
if there's muck in the Hartman grid or the Curry grid, it will clean up automatically if you work, work water lines. Okay. Um, to some extent, the Hartman grid relates more to the base chakra and can get very distorted 12 hours before an earthquake. Um, the curry grid relates more to the sacral chakra and uh, electro pollution, particularly. It may well be implicated, in it's the, or the transmitter of the electro pollution through it's been implicated in the spread of feline leukemia across the United States, for example. The curry grid. Generally, I reckon earth acupuncture, where you're um, having a therapeutic input into the quality of information field in the underground water line is the way to clean up all the others, except geological faults. And you can't do much about them except not build there. Um, there are tricks, but basically don't build there. On from that, we're looking at all the modern stuff. Electromagnetic fields, industrial medical ionizing radiation, microwave, radial wave transmissions, DC field disruptions caused by metal objects like cast iron beds, uh, bedsteads and metal mattresses, metal mattress springs. All this stuff we need to think of in and looking at environmental medicine, and looking at the contemporary um, quality of what's going on in our environment. So here we have an example of two underground streams on the left. And again, the scientification of geopathic stress theory is starting. The Germans are particularly good at it, um, measuring subtleties and um, inventing new machines like scintillometers, which is a very subtle Geiger counter that can measure changes in alpha and gamma radiation and some aspects of geopathic stress. Um, so we hear from the baseline of 65,000 nanoteslas, the discharging field drops to 53,000 over an underground stream or an underground stream crossing, where we would expect a doubling of stagnation if there's a problem traumatic problem. Conversely, a geological fault that it rises up to 73,000 nanotesla. Probably the more scientifically quantifiable aspects of geopathic stress become the more um, it's going to get recognized in this country. Um, it's taken so seriously now that no cancer patient is sent home from hospital in Austria or southern Germany without having their bed checked by a dowser. And um, as I said, um, increasingly, not just in Austria and Germany, but also places like Norway and Iceland, there's an increasing amount of uh, attention paid to the subtleties of geopathic stress and how they can inform not just health, but also luck. Um, I hit upon once a, a Shosa, Southern African, runic tradition, and the rune for luck was a simple X. Maybe a sleeping over a, a white stream crossing, a shung stream crossing. Maybe a sleeping over a sha stream crossing. It's the X that determines luck for good or bad. And this is a very classic illustration by Joseph Kopp of some of the clues, the signs and symptoms of having a geopathically stressed waterline, a waterline that's carrying in its information field distressed information. And some of the gaps in hedges and tree cankers and so on lightning strikes. If you want more of this, I've got an excruciatingly, atingly long compendium of information up on my website. There's a land and spirit. Um, there's a card at the back. Uh, and um, find the tab called Geopathic Stress. And there's a kind of compendium from all sorts of different global geomantic traditions of information and takes on geopathic stress.